Well, friends, the Lenten season is just right around the corner. It's quickly approaching. And as we kick things off with Ash Wednesday, we'll undoubtedly garner some looks for non-Catholics while we're out and about. Sometimes those looks turn into curious questions from non-Catholics. So when someone asks the smudged Ash question, how do you usually answer? We are joined today by the founder and CEO of Exodus 90, Jamie Baxter, to help us answer that question and others. Jamie, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, Mary, it's a joy. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. Our team has been so looking forward to this conversation with you, and not just because it's Lent, but because you've developed a really terrific program uh, for helping men uh, to become better men and also to become closer to Christ, which is a wonderful combination. So let's just kind of start with that first question. When somebody comes up to you, you're at the post office or what have you, and you've got those ashes on your forehead, and someone says, what's that? Did you know there's dirt on your forehead? How do you usually answer that question? Oh, yeah. No, I can. I get questions for sure. I didn't used to get questions in seminary because uh, we all had the ashes and looked, right. you know, look, looked the same. But, uh, you know, I think it's something like, hey, you know, uh, we're dust and to dust we're going to return. You know, I don't know. Just to, to remind us of our mortality and ultimately, um, you know, our, our dependence. And, and, and I think, too, you know, I do find, I don't know about you, Mary, but ashes to be somewhat humbling, right? I mean, it's you, you feel strange. I, I certainly feel strange. And um, it does feel like this beautiful ex- expression that, you know, we've been claimed, you know, by the right. Lord. And, right. um, you know, we're, we're sons and daughters of, of the Father, you know. And I think, uh, you know, I'll also try to just, you know, talk about that. You know, a little bit. you know, it's interesting to me that although Ash Wednesday is not a Holy Day of Obligation, that is one of the busiest church days of the year, along with, I would think, Christmas and Easter. And um, I, I think in, in a way, everyone at, at some point in their life wants to be called to conversion. And even Catholics who are not practicing are very, very much attached to Ash Wednesday and to going and to receiving ashes. Um you know, at my parish, I don't know if this is normative, but we do see a lot of people, once ashes are given, they leave. They don't stay for the rest of the Mass, but they want those ashes. Yeah. Why Why do you think that is that even non-practicing Catholics or infrequently pa- practicing Catholics are so drawn to Ash Wednesday? Well, I've heard people uh, somewhat cynically remark that, you know, it's because you get something. Right. When we give stuff away, yeah. palms and ashes, people, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder if there's not something something deeper. You know, I think um, I in my own family, you know, there are, are parts of the family that are really into the faith. You know, there, there are other parts that are not. Um, but there is this draw of Ash Wednesday. You know, maybe it's a, a return to, you know, norms of the past in some sense. Um, you know, and, and I think there's even something beautiful about that. I mean, every encounter mm-hmm. in the liturgy is an opportunity for grace, you know, to take root in a, a new way in the future. So I don't know, at least for me, um, I've always tried to stay just very hopeful, very optimistic, grateful, you know, for the full of, for the fuller pews. Um, admittedly, I must confess this. I mean, in central Indiana, I mean, the church is alive and well. I mean, our, our, our parish is going crazy. So, um, I, but I know that's just not the, the parish experience all around the country, depending on, on where you're at. So, uh, but even our parish can feel fuller. And I, I think it's a, a wonder, wonderful opportunity. Um, you know, and there's just something, something beautiful about people knowing that, you know, maybe they're missing out on something that, that they need and maybe they miss right. and maybe, maybe grace can take root, you know, in a yeah. new way, you know, moving well, forward. I, I think everyone's looking for an opportunity, um, and sometimes a structured opportunity is the best way to do this, to improve themselves. And you're the founder and the CEO of Exodus 90, which is specifically geared towards preparing men for Easter. So can you explain where that name comes from, Exodus 90, and why you felt called to start this? Well, it's been quite the journey. I've been at at work on it now for about 10 years, which is uh, hard to wrap my head around. Uh, And it's blossomed from very humble beginnings and origins to, to something, you know, so far beyond uh, my imagination for it and, and even control, you know, at this point. Um, you know, so Exodus 90, so it's a, it's a 90 day journey through the book of Exodus. Uh, a little bit of a fun fact is uh, we never intended it uh, as, as a 90 day journey leading up to Easter. That's something that 
happened to us. So in our first year, you know, we had a couple hundred guys. I didn't think much of it, but in our second year, we had like a, a like 1200, 1300 guys joined within a couple of days leading up to Easter of 2017. And I was just like, well, how did you go about advertising it? What did you put it on social media? Was it done through parish or word of mouth? So, so uh, some friends and I had started a blog called those like in 2012 or 2013. And so we kind of launched it out of that. Um, and you know, we had a little bit of social media, you know, work going. Um, but, uh, not much to a marketing plan, to be honest with you. And I had a couple business mentors sit me down after some of the successes that that I was mentioning. And they're like, "Okay, what what was the plan? How did you do it?" And I didn't have much to say, you know, because essentially what happened in year two was that the men from year one had, you know, were blessed and they shared that with their friends, you know, and and very simply, right. it's a big part of why we've been growing and have been growing that way ever since. So, and and this whole idea of it leading to Easter was 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 the men taking it up and kind of grafting it onto the liturgical calendar, which we've extended in so many ways over the last many years. But, um, you know, what's really cool about Exodus is, um, you know, it started really humbly as like a seminary, kind of a subculture or underground seminary formation program. I was studying for the Diocese of Lafayette, Indiana, and uh, and there was just a, a core kind of fraternity of guys and uh, where this kind of emerged from. And... Um, I discerned that God had called me to, to marriage and family life and to, to a mission in the world. And I didn't know what that meant. And so the guys were, were very much like, hey, you know, what if Exodus has, has a, a life out there in the world, you know? And so um, that's basically I went full time, you know, from day one, you know, trying to apply kind of the work that had started with Exodus uh, for laymen today. And for me, I was just so deeply passionate about this because uh, I went to for, to seminary formation at the age of 18. I discerned out six years later at the age of 24. And I experienced a void in formation. And I experienced in myself just like, wow, I don't have these support systems that I used to have. And I could just feel the world kind of grinding on me and um, me suffering in that. And so Exodus really became a response to a, a profound need. A need for, for structure? is Was it going from a very structured spiritual life to kind of a spiritual life, you know, a la carte, and you needed something to fill that particular piece of it, or was it something more? Yeah, you know, I think it's 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 a little more than just the structure. I think, you know, the, the foundation of Exodus is prayer, contemplative prayer, and growing in the confidence that we're capable of communion and relationship uh, with God. Um, so, um, you know, that's you know, just trusting a prayer life and having a prayer life at all. That's, that's a tough, tough to maintain within the hustle of marriage and family right. and work life. Right. You know, but also it's like, I, I was just stunned, you know, from how much community that I had by how hard it was to find hmm. peers that truly knew who I was. Like, it's one thing to go to mass. It's another thing to be known. And right. it, it's just so easy within just the, the structures that exist to be, profoundly lonely, you know? And so mm -hmm. one of the things that's so beautiful about Exodus is it's communal, you know, it's meant for fraternity right. guys, you know, groups of, you know, four to seven guys or so. And, uh, it's not a place to, to really just act like you have it all together or to, and it's not really a study, a Bible study. It's more mm -hmm. just like, Hey, like, how are you? You know, where, where mm -hmm. are you? You know, what's going on? And I think that's what, you know, part of what makes Exodus so special. Well, break down the program for us. How does it start? How does one join? And then how does it unfold in your life? Yeah, wonderful questions. I mean, every man comes to Exodus for a reason. And, um, you know, it, it fundamentally, it's about growing in freedom. What does that mean? It's just the just, just obvious today. And, and really, it's anyone that's honest with themselves that pharaohs plague us, idols distract us, you know? We all have them in our lives, you know? And um, so every guy who comes to Exodus is struggling with some kind of Pharaoh, some kind of idol. Mm -hmm. And, um, at the very beginning of the process, we just encourage guys to name that, you know, what is it that keeps me from love? So, uh, you know, one of the things that we really focus on every day is that, you know, Exodus isn't just another men's challenge. It's not about proving anything to anyone or to yourself. Obviously it's not about earning grace. Um, but it is about, uh, really coming to understand how dependent we are on God for freedom, 
so mm-hmm. that we can enter into our vocations for love, however it is that God has called us to love. So anyway, that's kind of the thrust of why a guy would join a fraternity. Right. Um, but the process is, is really very simple. Um, we're just representing the church's ancient traditions of prayer, asceticism, which is a kind of a fancy traditional word for acts of self-denial, uh, and fraternity. You know, So uh, we've talked about uh, a little bit about the fraternity component, but uh, on the prayer side, you know, uh, we, we were made for communion with the Lord and he speaks, he's alive. And I don't know about mm-hmm. you, Mary, but it's easy for me to forget that. And mm-hmm. uh, one of the most common interactions I have with my spiritual director is like, hey, have you taken all those concerns to the Lord Jesus? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I like, I need to be reminded of that all the time. Right. You know, we all do, I think. Yeah. 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 So is that, are the groups called fraternities? Is that? Yeah. We call them fraternities. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and those are groups of four to seven men. Yeah. Uh, typically. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Yep. You know, and so every day we commit to, to prayer, you know, and we've crafted reflections to lead men into a conversation with the Lord. Um, you know, and it's kind of uniquely crafted with the struggles of men in mind and really trying to make the scriptures very approachable and Mm -hmm. relatable. So that's, uh, that's kind of where we focus from a content perspective. Um, but admittedly it's the disciplines that can get a little bit of attention, you know, it's like, and, and, um, you know, guys during Exodus 90 take, take cold showers, you know, we fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, we don't abandon technology. We just try to return it to its place as a tool, you know, within Mm -hmm. our work or our school, um, commitments, um, and you know, there's a, there's a host of, of other things, but it's all about kind of saying no to, um, not even just bad things, but even good things for a period of time so that we can return to our identity as sons and uh, focus on what really matters in life. So it's that prayerful ascetic and kind of fraternal components that make Exodus, uh, really what it is. Well, although, as you note, it's the asceticism that gets the attention, um, which does not surprise me in today's culture, because our our culture is so sort of um, focused on rules, right? This idea that rules are anything that calls you to be more than you are and feel or forces you to improve. Um, those are just, you know, racial or patriarchal oppression tools, and they're keeping you from liberation and pure freedom. And, um, but you're, you know, Exodus 90 seems to promote this idea that, um, you know, that, that says the opposite, that says that the structure and these rules, if you will, this ascetic piece of it, um, helps you to ha- aim at something higher than yourself. Mm-hmm. And can you talk a little bit about why following these, um, I guess, concrete, uh, steps or plan that you have in Exodus 90 for the men who join, How does that help you to be more free when on its face, it looks like it's helping you to be a lot more restricted? Yeah, Mary, that's such a good question. And I think my response to that is somewhat nuanced and we don't really fit into a great box. Um, So you're right. Like on the one hand, you'd say rules are oppressive, but then on on, on a flip side, and there's like this real movement, especially in young men today towards a kind of stoicism. Hmm. And it's all about, you know, just kind of getting, getting everything together, getting your life together, this kind of discipline equals freedom perspective. I don't think that's right either. Actually. I don't, I don't think either approach is a Christian understanding of, of freedom uh, that we're trying to promote with Exodus. So what I like to say is just very simply, um, structures are helpful, you know, and every one of us, you know, regardless of our vocations needs Hmm. a plan for our life, you know, and to make sure that, where we are hitting the most important things, our prayer time, obviously, uh, time for deep relationship with our spouse, time for sorority or fraternity, you know, with other, you know, uh, peers of the same sex journeying, you know, with similar struggles um, at this moment in time. Um, these things are really important. And so we like to look at Exodus as, um, as just a framework that really removes a lot of what I would just call cultural lies to things that we need, you know? And Mm -hmm. so, so everyone today, right. I mean, just as an example, feels like they're so busy and I, I just don't believe that we're busy at all. And the guys that in the first couple of weeks at Exodus are stunned by how much time they have. Um, and it's ironic. Like you can even think like, wow, Exodus is just all these commitments, takes all this time. No, I mean, the, one of the many gifts of Exodus in the beginning is like, wow, I have tons of time to do my work well. 
Hmm. I have tons of time to focus on each of my children and my spouse. I'm just prioritizing the wrong things. Right. And, that's interesting. Uh, you know, and so so that's that's a real kind of a shift. Uh, so, you know, again, like structure and and personal plans of life are really very helpful. And we look at kind of our our rules, if you will, or our disciplines to be just directives, you know, um, and, and helpful. At the same time, though, I think the thing I really would like to kind of kind of challenge is this idea that if we just follow the rules, we will be free. Uh, this mm-hmm. is untrue. You know, and, and Exodus is, it's not a magic bullet. It's not like 90 days and you're all better or anything like this. Right. Um, I don't actually believe that discipline equals freedom. I mean, freedom ultimately uh, is, is a grace. And in a Catholic vision, um, it's inspired by grace, but we're called to give a response in our will, uh, you know, mm-hmm. of, of choosing a better path, right? And so we don't look at Exodus as, uh, you know, a, there's no perfect journey. There's ups and downs and all arounds. Just look at the Israelites. I mean, the journey's a complete mess, all right? And that's our lives. I mean, all of our lives are that way. And um, and so that's kind of the the nuance that we try to thread. Like, yeah, discipline's important, but all of this is about growing in dependence on God who provides a grace. Well, are you able to share the 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 rules, if you will, since we've been using that word for lack of a better adjective? Um, if a man, so say my husband joins uh, on Ash Wednesday, joins you all, what is gonna what's required? of someone who wants to participate in the program. Yeah. So one new thing I'd really, I'd say here is uh, guys can join on Ash Wednesday and just join up with existing Exodus 90 fraternities okay. um, or form new ones for Lent. Um, but it's going to be a powerful journey through the book of Joshua, actually. So we're going to really focus on this theme of colonizing the promised land is kind of our, mm-hmm. our theme this year, uh, which we would welcome everyone joining us for Ash Wednesday to begin. So uh, on the on the prayer side, so we encourage guys to uh, spend an hour in prayer. That can sound like a lot, and and obviously some people might not be able to swing that. And so what we try to say is like, hey, get your daily reflection in. It only takes like five to ten minutes, mm-hmm. um, and then commit to at least twenty minutes of silence with the Lord. You know, so okay. you know if you can spend that time, that's a great foundation for daily encounter. So does ma- daily mass count for that? I would say no actually. But I, if you can get to daily mass, that's wonderful. Um, and one interesting thing, Mary, too, about Exodus is about 85% of our guys are Catholics. Uh, 15% are not. So hmm. we have guys that are not actually practicing a faith. We have men of other Christian denominations in Exodus now, uh, which is a beautiful thing. you know. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, we've made it kind of approachable for everyone, but deeply rooted in the Catholic uh, tradition where we're all centered. Um, so that's kind of on the prayer side. On the ascetic side, uh, we encourage guys to get a full night's sleep. That doesn't sound like asceticism maybe, but, you know, we're all sleep deprived. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so we're very, really science focused as a team. And, uh, well, unfortunately for everybody, the literature on sleep is uh, uh, effectively infallible. The, the percent of people that don't need eight hours, hours of sleep rounds to zero. And so we just encourage guys to sleep. <laughs> Uh, and at least in my own experience, when I do, I'm a much more centered person. Uh, mm-hmm. So guys take cold showers. Uh, that's one of the things we're kind of known for. What's the what's the the logic or the rationale yeah. behind that? It's it's a great question, and there's deep deep logic. So um, what you might know not know about you know cold water therapy in general is that it provides some of the most dynamic dopamine hits in your brain that are hmm. possible. Okay. And it's like, well, why did that happen? And so, so for, for people even in like, that are really in like addictions programs and you'll, you'll see like addicts talk about this. One of, one of the most helpful kind of reliefs for them in withdrawal periods is like cold water because hmm. it provides releases in their brains that, you know, are really, you know, hard to achieve in, in other things. Hmm. Uh, so why is that the case evolutionarily It's well? It's like bathing was obviously important you know, for, for, uh, health and, you know, cleanliness. Uh, but it's not like we always had hot water available to us. And so like, what's the incentive to jump into what is like an extreme and uncomfortable uh, environment? Well, the brain over time responds with, you know, profound, profound hits of dopamine. And so, so, so a quick secret here is, yeah, it's like, it's hard to begin, but like, once you start cold showers, it's like profoundly like there's just a relief actually. And uh, you feel it, you feel it in your brain, you know, in an interesting way. 
So it goes beyond being invigorating. It it really there's a and an even psychosomatic, right? There's a, absolutely I, well. I know for people like who suffer from migraines, it's one of the things they tell you to do is to dip your get a bowl of ice water, like yeah. and and dip your face and your head as much as you and stay as long as you can. And it and for some people, it provides relief that even you know strong medications don't. So that's that's interesting to hear. Yeah. So for us, it's like, it's this blend between, you know, we take the, the sciences in general, I take the psychological sciences in particular, um, very seriously. And so what we're trying to achieve with Exodus is like a human and a spiritual integration. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so we kind of, you know, blend all those things together in the experience. So we exercise a couple times a week, obviously important to engage our bodies in, in motion. And we, we allow guys to kind of take that how they would, whether that's running, walking, wherever they're at, we just encourage them to, do something with your body physically. Yeah. 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 And well, let's talk, we've talked about the, you know, a little bit about the discipline of the program, but what are some of the fruits of transformation that you've seen uh, with men who have come through your program? Yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. I mean, part of this is, yeah, there's like dramatic stories, but there's also really simple stories uh, as well. Uh, We've had about a hundred thousand men now through Exodus in our first uh, almost 10 years. Um, I think my first thing is just just ask the guys you know that have been through Exodus, like what do they have to say about it? Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of the day, they're the reason that that we grow. So maybe I'll just give a personal kind of witness, I, I guess, to, to to the question. I think that's probably the best route. So for me, um, you know, this year I'm in a local local fraternity, mm-hmm. and I just moved back uh, home. So I grew up in Central Indiana, but have been away effectively since I went off to college. So it's it's been like 15 years. I'm like. I'm back home, mm-hmm. but I don't know anyone. I don't have real relationships, you know, really. And I, I, it's, I miss that. And I know that that's not okay if I'm going to live a, live the life I feel like God's called me to live. Um, fortunately for me, <laughs> Exodus is huge at the parish. Mm-hmm. And um, so anyway, there's like five, five groups this year. And oh, wow. uh, just as a, uh, so about 50 guys, which is really cool. And guys at really different places in the spiritual life. Um, some, I got a guy in my fraternity this year who, who doesn't practice the faith. He said one of the most profound things though yesterday. He's like, uh, we just met last night and he was like, you know, I'm a couple of weeks into this and I know I'm a bad Catholic, but I think I want to be a good Catholic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so he's kind of making a plan to go to confession for the first time in decades, basically. Right. Well, praise God. And uh, yeah, it's like, cool. You know, so that's that's like a cool thing to to see this year. But for me personally, Mary, it's like, I'm building fraternity with guys, you know, in my parish and Mm -hmm. I didn't have that, you know, before Exodus. So, um, you know, that's just a quick hit of what I'd say in my own life this week from Exodus. Well, and I imagine the stories are as varied as people are, as men are. And um, we have at least, at least one of our staff members who is doing Exodus 90 this season. And he said, um, one of the misconceptions he had about the program before he started it, that it's more about the stuff that you give up. But in mm. fact, it's really more about the stuff that you add in place of the stuff that you've given up. So, um, you know, as as it's gone on, it's less about the cold showers and no beer and no TV, but it's a lot more about the daily prayer and yeah. adoration. So, you know, first sacrifice and then taking action to replace the sacrifice with something else. Mm-hmm. And it's like a like a reset for your whole spiritual life. Does that? Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that's, no, I think that's wonderful. And I mean, this gets back to kind of the the reason for the journey. It's like, it's we grow in freedom, not to just do whatever we want. You know, that's kind of the world's conception of, um, you know, freedom. For us, right. it's, as Christians, it's uh, ultimately to embrace our vocations for love, you know, and obviously that's expressed to us perfectly in Jesus on the cross, you know, yeah. and yeah. Um, each of us are called to participate, you know, in that mystery in a unique way. Yeah, St. Augustine said, you know, freedom is the freedom to do the good. Mm. And so... Beautiful. Yeah. You know, yeah. No, there's a lot of different ways to look at it or sum it up or, you know, make it into a meme. But, um, uh, you know, I, I like the way that you said that. That's a, that's really beautiful. But let's... So I want to talk to you a little bit today as well, not only about the program and its benefits to men, but masculinity itself. Because yeah. if we look at today's media, marketing entertainment, um, a lot of it, not, not exclusively, but a lot of it portrays men, you know, specifically straight, white, and usually Christian men like you. Um, 
as if you're sort of the crux of all that is wrong with the world. And um, so you guys get vilified, you get emasculated, uh, belittled, and told that your place, you know, basically is in the past and it has no purpose in today's modern modern world. So um, a lot of this, I, I am, I'm a girl mom, but my, my husband's one of five boys, but, you know, he talks about how a lot of this is being fed to young men at a very early age. And then all the way through adulthood, they grow up kind of feeling bad about themselves for no other reason than who they are, that they're a straight, white, Christian or Catholic man. Um, and so it, oddly enough, this might actually produce the monster that the progressive left came to be fighting against, you know, right? This could, this is sort of produce the, um, the, the Don Quixote style, uh, hyper-masculine, um, anti-woman man that mm-hmm. the left said exists, uh, already. Does that, does that make sense? The, um, and what would be the antidote to that, to saying to young boys, there's something wrong with you because you're, you're a white straight male and that so, yeah. and somehow something intrinsic in you oppresses other people. Yeah. Gosh, that's a great question, Mary. We could talk about this for probably 10 hours. Um, so I'm going to do my best to give you a good, good response here quickly. Um, I think a couple of things. I'm, I'm a pretty optimistic person. Uh, so I do see a lot of really wonderful responses to a lot of those um, stereotypes and criticisms of men that I, I thought were kind of roaring and hard to escape, you know, about, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, two or three years ago. I mean, it was just like peak noise about this stuff. And I do feel like there's just been both in the church, but also in just other, um, you know, you know, virtuous people in general, like responses to this, like, obviously these are are straw men that we've raised and are seeking to tear down. And Mm -hmm. also they don't correspond to what is true, which is to say they won't last the test of time. Uh, They have no durability. And Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually just filled with hope that, you know, obviously these lies and stereotypes will fall to pieces. All of them do eventually. Um, And so, but the other thing I would just say is that um, at least in my own life, it is stunning actually that, like when we're called forth to do a work and we seek to be faithful to what's in front of us, there's nothing stopping you from making your dent in the universe. Uh, and you know, it's just like, you know, listen, when I look, when I, when I look back at Exodus, even over the last 10 years, it's stunning, you know, what's gone on with it. Um, and it's, it's not because I'm super smart or anything, you know, but it is definitely touching and serving men in a place of profound need that they're not finding in other places today. And so, you know, in some sense I've chosen to, to play, you know, obviously this is a podcast going out to a broad audience, but I really don't get into a lot of the, the, what I think are just distracting conversations about this. I just try to, to make a difference in the world, you know, that, that I can through Exodus and allow God to, to bless it and, and ultimately to, to do the work. And, um, to do the work with it and allow it to bear the fruit. And so I think those are just two responses. One, I do think that these tides are are shifting generally, but two, nothing is stopping a man from fulfilling his potential, you know, and, and the grace of God unfolding in his life and assuredly lies that don't correspond to reality um, mm. can't stop him. And so as it relates to you, you did bring this up, you know, about kind of these kind of lies penetrating young men at a young age. It's like, this is why the formation of children is just so important, why the presence of fathers in families is unquestionably the, one of the most important things for the human development of a child. From a, from a religious perspective, a father's faith is the most predictive factor on whether or not the child will practice a faith as adults. So it's just like the father's impact on forming a child and, and what is true, good, and beautiful in the fullness of the faith, modeling that in his example is of unquestionable and unreplaceable value. Um, so, you know, his example, his witness, correcting those lies, that's, that's his place, uh, in the home. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's interesting because I think all the social science is starting to back this up now that the damage that can be done by a bad father is not only incalculable, it really is. It's also multi-generational. It yeah. can be passed down. 
a man who wasn't raised by a father because the father was absent or by a bad father would then pass that on to his children who passes it on to their children. So it reverberates, yeah. right? And um, so it is, it is so important that men are, you know, uh, strong and faithful and doing all the things that, you know, I think Exodus yeah. 90 is hoping to help them do. Yeah, Mary, that's just so true. I mean, we, the scriptures talk about, you know, sins redounding to generations. Generation, I mean, right? you know, to the, to the seventh, uh, the seventh generation or something. Yeah. 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 And so, and that's just obviously true. And I think, um, you know, two things, I mean, for those who had, you know, broken father figures, it's, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. I mean, that's not your fault, you know, right. but there are opportunities, you know, for healing and for grace, you know, and a couple of thoughts I would just give is, you know, finding peers, you know, who are living a life like the one you want to live and are the kinds of fathers you want to be, you know, just putting yourself into a tribe that's better than you, you know, mm. is so important. Obviously, Exodus can help with that, but there are many other examples of just wonderful uh, men's initiatives uh, in the church and even secularly to, to look to. But also finding, you know, a mentor, an older man, you know, who's come before you, has experienced life, it's ups and downs, it's all arounds, can be deeply helpful. You know, and then also it's just, listen, I mean, all of us can suffer and go through traumas that shouldn't have happened to us. It's just mm -hmm. a part of living in a fallen world. Right. So seeking counsel, a therapist, you know, for, for deep traumas, I, I really encourage. It's been a huge part of my own story uh, that's been so deeply helpful in overcoming burdens that uh, alone or even with peers, you know, yeah. I, I needed an expert to guide me. You know, all right. of those things can be, you know, profoundly helpful. And then my encouragement to... To, to us as we're trying to become these good fathers and allow that witness to redound to generations is that doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It's like, you're going to make mistakes. We all do. You know, there are moments where it's like, that's not the father I am, you know, and that's just a, you know, being humble, accepting that, asking for grace, apologizing, um, all those things I just think are, are so important and uh, ultimately will redound to, to a better future. Right. And then I think what else your program can add to that is just introducing to men as to men, the heavenly father, to God, the father oh, yeah. who is perfect. And yeah. um, it's because some men may have no experience of that yeah. or may be hesitant to have a relationship with a fatherly God because their own uh, earthly father yeah. was so yeah. imperfect. Well, it's Mary, and that's just such a, a profound, and I think it's an important thing for us to recognize. It's that like the concept of God the Father can be really challenging because of poor natural level experiences. I right. think it, we need to accept that. It's just like, this is this is hard, you know? And one book I just really would recommend if I could, it's called Personal Prayer. It's written by Father Boniface Hicks uh, and uh, Father Thomas Acklin, I believe, is his, his spiritual director, Father Boniface's spiritual director. It's called Personal Prayer, and it really talks about the human foundations um, and, and kind of how our human relationships um, in some way image kind of our divine relationships. And then how do we overcome, you know, the challenges that we've experienced in the natural world as we try to relate to God who is revealed to us by Jesus as our Father? You know, right. that's a really hard thing. So I just want to recommend that book. Father Boniface does a masterful job of, of helping men and women to, to really, you know, journey through some of those challenges. But you're right, Mary, through faith and then hopefully through experience, we come to see that, yeah, like the, the revelation of Jesus is that we are in relationship in, with the Father, you know, um, not this faceless entity or abstract clock maker guy, mm -hmm. but no, a father. He's the perfect right. father. Perfect. And everything that's happened to us in a providential worldview is unfolding for our greatest good. Mm -hmm. You know, if we do the work and if we stay in grace, uh, I think we can see that. When you look at what men, um, particularly men who are uh, married, they have so many responsibilities and duties, especially when they're both husbands and fathers. And so there's this silent gravity on their shoulders that I think women might not necessarily um, understand and that they don't have in the same way. Obviously, women have responsibilities too that are serious, but not in the same way. Um, so how does a man know if he's doing all those things uh, to fulfill those duties and responsibilities? Um, is, is that something you can know? Um, and does, it, does your program help with that to reveal those things to him? 
And then if they aren't, how do they go about taking that first step to, to yeah. be a better protector, a better provider? Um, all the things that God the Father, you know, a, a better healer, a better, you know, that God the Father promises that he provides for us. Yeah, Mary, that's, uh, I'm sorry, every time you ask a question like that, I'm just really stunned by the gravity of it uh, and want to talk more about what that could be. I think, I mean, a couple of thoughts about how, how, are, how do you know where you are relative to, you know, fulfilling your role? you know, and your place and especially specifically in family life, a couple of thoughts I have, I, at least in my own experience, my spouse is the ultimate form of accountability. Okay. I mean, she is so wonderful, so loving, wonderful mother, so caring, just, just, just a beautiful woman uh, all around. And, but boy, is she a form of accountability for me. And, and I know pretty quickly, actually, it's like, Hey, I know your work's important. I need this X thing to happen or to like Joseph, our son, our four-year-old needs this, you know? And I, I ultimately believe that this is the companionship that we've been knit for in marriage. Right. Uh, it's like, this is our, 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 our partner who God has knit us for, provided for us, um, to, you know, to fulfill, you know, his plan for our lives uh, and to image, you know, his love. Mm -hmm. And so I think my first thing is just, um, you know, F finding that kind of traction in marriage if you don't have it or rekindling it or just just really focusing there i mean i think is just so important um and i would say maybe the role of fraternity here it's like some people can say like gosh these fraternity meetings every week that's a big time commitment it's taking away from the family mm -hmm. and i i don't want to dismiss that i mean it is taking time in the week but at least for me just a, on an experiential level i'm so inspired by other men going through the same struggles in that same responsibility as me with right. all of the challenges that we face and just hearing them talk, hearing them process, admitting their failures, you know, but each of us united by this desire and, and knowledge that our wives deserve better from us. You know, our children need more from us. And so I do just think, you know, scripturally we can talk about it as, you know, iron sharpening iron, but it's like that time in fraternity sends me back motivated you know, to, to fulfill, you know, who I'm called to be for my spouse, my children, you know, et cetera. So ultimately I think to the question of how do you know, that's where accountability is so important. That's why we can't live isolated lives, you know, because if you're just following your own way, you're, you're just going to be lost, you know, pretty yeah. quickly. John Paul wrote about this endlessly, you know, men and women are complementary, and authentic masculinity is in no way a threat to authentic mm. femininity. And I ultimately believe it's when we're stuck in stereotypes, ideologies, abstractions, lies, mm -hmm. um, that we start to act as though we're in a competition which does not exist and mm. is not how we have been knit uh, by our Lord and how we have been created. And so for me, um, when I look at our work at Exodus, it's, that has nothing to do with either a machismo, you know, on one hand or an effeminacy on the other. We're just trying to, um, create a space, uh, in prayer, asceticism and fraternity, you know, that, uh, that's hopefully very encouraging uh, and empowering. And, um, you know, I think, you know, women need those, you know, similar spaces, you know, in order to become who they are. And, mm -hmm. um, when that happens, and then we come together, how we're called to in marriage, uh, and, and other other forms of communion, good things happen, you know, because right. we each reveal something of the image of God, which the other does not. I do think having someone who you're um, is a spiritual companion to you provides benefits to everyone in the family. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I would just triple click on that. I mean, um, at least as I, I think about our own marriage and family, it's just apart from the faith, I just, it would just be so different. I wouldn't, I almost can't even understand how, how it all goes down. You know, it's just, it, it's just, it is so core to who Colleen and I are um, and how we understand, you know, our marriage, you know, um, and some of the sufferings, you know, we've been through together. You know, uh, apart from the cross, you know, it, it would feel empty of meaning, you know, and, 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 and not, not fully, 
you know, what I signed up for, what she signed up for, you know? So yeah. anyway, um, yeah, I just, the importance of the faith and understanding the spirituality, the spiritual realities of life uh, is unquestionably important. And I think too, you know, the the devil hates a good marriage. Yeah. I, I think there's absolutely no question. So to understand that there's that peace, I mean, not to live our lives in fear, but to, to that there is a spiritual battle going on that we can't mm-hmm. see and why it's so important to stay close to the Lord and the sacraments yeah. and, you know, to be able to deny ourselves when that's necessary. Yeah. I love that you said though, not to live in fear, because sometimes I think when people get into this, the spiritual warfare kind of concept or start doing their reading or their listening, they can be like, Whoa, I didn't realize all this stuff's going right. on. Right, and right, it's right. like, for me, I've been inundated with this from a very young age, fortunately. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and just in, in my experience so far, it's, you know, I, Obviously, deliverance prayers are very important. Father Ritberger wrote a wonderful book for 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 the laity and mm-hmm. laymen in particular to like really enter into their role in a family and protecting it spiritually, you know, and bringing mm-hmm. those realities to bear on conversation, relationship, etc. I'd recommend that. At the same time, I would say, you know, getting back to where we, you know, other parts of this conversation through baptism and through participation in the sacramental life of the church. Um, you know, we are, you know, by God's grace and his preference for us and his mystery, we're living the life, you know, with all of the means at our disposal, you know, and, and it's just important to remember that we've been claimed as sons and daughters. And yes, uh, I was, I, 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 uh, I was listening to a homily is from Archbishop Aquila. It was actually at a, an Exodus event. We had a wonderful summit of, of men out in Colorado. And he just said, I want to remind you that the devil can't touch you. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like when you are in grace and you are, um, you know, living in your identity, you have such power and he's terrified of you. And especially when you rely on the intercession of saints, St. Joseph, the terror of the demons. Yes. You, you know, St. Michael, it's just like, uh, you're a force to be reckoned with, you know, in this life and the next. Well, I like what you said. You stay in a, you know, it's so important to stay in a state of grace or as close to that as you possibly can. And to frequent the sacraments and use sacramentals and all of those things provide protection. And I I just think we live in a time, unfortunately, when a lot of men and women haven't been catechized properly for in that regard. So it's, it's wonderful that, you know, these kind of things are available to us and helping to make people aware of them is that's a real service to them spiritually. Oh yeah, no, a hundred percent. And, you know, I think, well, I mean, one of my, I mean, heck, when you even look at the work of Exodus, all we're doing is representing ancient treasures in a new way yeah. for men today. Yeah. That's it. That's why it's effective. And um, honestly, so much of how I think we move forward is remembering from where we've come. Uh, and it's not to go backwards. Uh, it's absolutely to take the deep work you need to do uh, in prayer to just ask the Lord, what is he calling forth in you, you know, yes. uniquely, you know, unlike in anyone else for now. But it's to remember that we stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, in our tradition, as I think uh, Ratzinger said. Before we wrap up our conversation, ask you some questions about Lent, because again, yeah, uh, you know, we're com- It's right around the corner, and so you know, we're asked as Catholics to take on additional prayer, fasting, and almsgiving during Lent. Um, and other than during Lent, I don't think the average Catholic practices fasting very much. Um, at, during the remainder of the year. So why is it so important to fast, not just during Lent when we're obligated to, but outside of Lent? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. I think very simply, we always have. I mean, the early Christians, to uh, almost as a way to distinguish themselves from the pagan world, adopted Wednesdays and Fridays as days of penance. Um, this is, of course, before the existence of Lent. Okay, so a lot of people... Well, even sometimes tr- more traditionally minded people would be like, oh man, Exodus 90, it's like, that's not Lent. You know, like, what are you doing with a pre-Lent? Well, it's funny. It's right. like Lent, Lent emerges as a practice. Even on old calendars, there was literally a pregame, you know, the 70 days before Easter. I mean, there was literally a pre-Lent, which we also have, are kind of trying to revive in our work in Exodus. Um, and, 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 and so ultimately it's to say on Wednesdays and Fridays, the day that Jesus you know, was handed over by Judas to the chief priest, obviously the day in which he's crucified on Friday. Uh, so the former being Wednesday, you know, the crucifixion being on Friday, those were days of penance, mm-hmm. you know, to enter into those sacred mysteries 
which are at the core, you know, of our faith and, um, you know, to, to make, you know, both reparation for the sins of the world, our own personal sins, which contribute to, to disorder, um, but also to make offerings, you know, to God. I mean, the Lord loves first fruits. He loves, he loves right. gifts back to him. And, um, you know, ultimately that, that is not a Lent thing. Like that's a, that's a Christian thing. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm not at all suggesting that we lose a healthy kind of balance with feasting. You know, ultimately there is no celebration apart from the divine, you know, the, the holy sacrifice of the mass is, uh, you know, Joseph Pieper uh, calls it the the height of leisure, the fulfillment of leisure. Uh, this is that's what worship is, and so um, Christians, and in a unique way, uh, have a reason for celebration. That if you're just partying because it's the AFC Championship game or whatever, you just don't have. You know, you just don't have, uh, not in its fullness anyway. And not that there's anything wrong with football. I'm I'm a huge Colts fan. Just to betray, you know, be honest. Okay. Um, but it's just to, to, to say that, you know, a, you know, without a fast, it's hard to really feast and have that any meaning to that. And so when I'm talking about times of, of penance and ultimately offering apart from Lent, it's not to say that we don't celebrate. I mean, we have the reason for the greatest celebration of the resurrection. Right. You know, I have a, a very devout Catholic um, a friend who's a father of seven children, beautiful family. And he... Um, he once said to me, he was part of kind of a men's group at his parish and they were a very ascetic, like, you know, kind of hardline group. And he said, you know, what drives me crazy about these guys, they can fast with the church, but they can't feast with the church. Yeah. Yeah. That's and I such thought, a wow. That's, and he said, they can't permit themselves, you know, to, to allow the, the joy of the feasting that, that Christ did when he was with us. That was very, it was very painful for him. And he was not in any way diminishing or disparaging their, um, their fasting for important things and for their family. But when they couldn't turn it around and allow themselves that extra beer on Christmas day or something, he just yeah. couldn't wrap his mind around. How, how do you keep Exodus 90 from moving in that direction where yeah. men get so, um, you know, you talked about the dopamine rush at, at the beginning of our conversation from the cold showers, that they get so attached to that, that the feasting part becomes harder to do. Yeah, Mary, that's a great question. I think it just in honesty, you know, in the first couple of years, like I, I kind of felt that like in some of our guys, that it was just like this sacrifice thing. And so uh, over the last like three or four years, we've really worked to integrate all of the feast days of the church into our daily content rhythm. So uh, today, when we're recording this, just to betray you know this to the audience, it's actually the conversion of St. Paul today. This is a major, this is a feast day. I mean, St. Paul's conversion shifted the course of, of history, you know? Right. Uh, so we relax disciplines today during Exodus. And so what's cool about that is most of the guys in Exodus are not actually following the liturgical calendar, okay? Like they, some of them don't even know what it is. And so the fact that we are like, it's not just about hard things. It's also letting them know like, hey, there's this like beautiful kind of cosmic logic to how the church has ordered, you know, the calendar. And so we get to mm -hmm. represent that to them as well. So I'd say that, you know, on the one hand, we, we always uh, celebrate um, solemnities and feast days, major feast days. Also every Sunday, you know, we relax disciplines as well, you know, as a, as a part of this. And this is, is somewhat new too in the last couple of years, but um, we have an Easter experience that's actually all about entering into a Christian vision for feasting, you know, and we, we, for us, that always focuses around getting families together, legitimately having feasts, you know, bringing our gifts together, um, you know, and, and uh, so that's become a, a really important thing for us. And so we, in, in our work with Exodus, you know, it's really not a 90 day thing. We really look at it as a daily formation tool um, that's there for men every day of the year, you know, and depending on when you pick it up, the themes are very different, you know? And so if you were to join us on Easter Sunday, which everyone is welcome to do that, if, you know, the, our Lent experience isn't for them, uh, I think they'll find themselves in a party, you know? And that's the point, you know, is that uh, ultimately, um, you know, what Christ won for us in his resurrection is the the highest reason for celebration. And, and that joy should manifest itself in how we live our lives. Well, what would you recommend to men who are just hearing about this program now, listening to this podcast? And I know you said we started on January 1st, 
But is there a way for men to get involved now if they'd like to? Absolutely. Yeah, you can join us on the Exodus 90 app every day of the year. Uh, so you can just download the app from the App Store, the Google Play Store, um, and we're here for you. So you, you can join us on any day of the year and you'll find a daily reflection that's been crafted to help you start your conversation with the Lord. Additionally, if you don't have a, a community, if you don't have a fraternity to join, uh, we just launched a, a community feature where you can get paired uh, with local men looking for you know a virtuous brotherhood like an Exodus fraternity is. Uh, and so I just encourage you to check it out. Uh, you know, and the platform exists and has been crafted to, to help you uh, live, you know, the Christian life every day of the year. Thanks so much for spending uh, such a generous amount of time with us today. And we wish you a very blessed Easter season uh, after your Lent is completed. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, God bless you. Have a great Lent, you know, and an awesome Easter too. Thank you for listening. To make it easier for you to listen to future Edify podcast episodes, please make sure you subscribe over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you.